So uh, just leads me to uh, welcome you to the November edition of Tell Researchers at Lancaster uh, with Dr. Sue Cranmer. Um, really excited to, to hear you uh, talk about um, what you do, Sue. And um, yes, uh, also just to introduce uh, Pu in as well, um, who will be moderating today. Oh, I'm John, by the way, I'm John Brindle. <laughs> I didn't even, didn't even introduce myself. I'm on cohort 14 of the uh, e-research and, and tell um, PhD program uh, at Lancaster University. And I'm about to embark on a new job as learning design manager at Edge Hill University in Ormskirk as well. And it just leaves me to, uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Sue Cranmer to the Tell Research at Lancaster. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you're going to introduce yourself uh, fantastically. Um, so Thanks very much, John. And thank you very much, Pooin, for the uh, invitation and to the whole team organising these. It's a great initiative. It really is. Um, I decided to watch some of the previous ones. I'd not had a chance to attend to get an idea of what to do and actually there's such a range but the one that I spent the most time looking at was Brett's and I think the reason for that I know <laughs> he's pulling the face the reason for that was he seemed to have the, uh, the articulated the same kind of hesitancy that I did about what do I do here I am so used to giving academic presentations it's like okay so what do I do here because you don't want my life story I'm pretty sure and I was thinking, what can I do that actually makes it relevant to you? And I'm not sure I've achieved that, but it'll be good to have your assessment of that. But it also made me kind of reflect back on my research career and think about how did I get to where I am now? Because I'm very pleased I've got here. You know, it's um, it's been damn hard work a lot of the time. Um, and a lot of things have happened which I never expected to along the way. In a lot of ways, it's totally surpassed what I expected, both from the job and my life, actually, generally. Um, in other ways, um, it's been a challenge. Um, so I was thinking the themes that actually I could speak to around this, um, but I'm not going to. I'm going to talk through what's happened over my research career. And you can tell me if they come out in what I'm saying. But I was was thinking the things that have made it happen really are hard work, tenacity, resilience, people. I've worked with some fantastic people all the way through my career. Um, luck, a lot of luck, um, a lot of flexibility, trying to morph yourself into many, many different shapes to keep a career in this because it's not easy. And finally moving house. I think between 2008 and 2014, we moved house seven times, my husband and I. And that's the kind of, um, I was just saying to a colleague here, Rebecca, you know, it cost us a fortune. It's, uh, and we're now reflecting on that as we reach pensionable age, how much we spent on stamp duty moving house, because it costs roughly three to 5,000 to move house each time, you know. So, um, I feel like in some ways you can be a bit too flexible um, and you need to be a bit careful that you're not giving your savings away all the time to stay in work. Having said that, you know, it's it's a well-paid job. As much as we're on strike, I think a number of us are on strike for different reasons, like the increased precariousness uh, for people coming into this now, which is much worse than when I started, much, much worse. Um, so we're seeing a downhill trend, but I am going off at a tangent here rather. So how did I get into what I do now? Um, as I said, there was quite a lot of luck, but I, I left school. I went to university. I had very little idea. Thanks, Pruying. I had very little idea of what I wanted to do. I knew quite a lot about what I didn't want to do. Um, and that was most things. Uh, I went to university in London and when I came out, luckily, there were quite a lot of jobs and most of the the work I could get most easily was as an administrator. So that's what I did. And I worked for places like the British Film Institute. I was very into film in the 80s. Um, and then I actually qualified as an English and media teacher at the end of the 80s. But all the time running up to there, I'd been studying a lot in terms of film studies and television studies. So I thought I'd pause being a teacher and I'd go and do a master's. So I did that in film and television studies. And um, as part of my teacher training qualification, I'd spent a year at the University of London at the Institute of Education, which is now, um, 
what's the word, merged with UCL. You've probably noticed the Institute of Education, UCL. And um, I was working there as an administrator and I, I actually went back to the department had done my PGC in because I liked it so much. So I actually went back and became what was then called a secretary, a secretary. But it was quite fascinating because I was secretary to Gunter Cress. So um, I learned an awful lot from him. And uh, there was also the people like uh, David Buckingham there and Jane Miller. So in a lot of ways, these were my heroes as a, a media what would I say? Enthusiasts, you know, so um, that was that was pretty good. And um, but after a while, I thought, I don't think this is enough for me. And I think that was helped by them telling me it wasn't enough for me. <laughs> they kept saying things like, you're the best administrator we've had for a while, but um, what are you doing here? And I kept thinking, well, maybe I should be doing something more then. Um, which I mean, it's very flattering to be told things like that. So I applied for a research job. I didn't even get an interview. <laughs> so that was the, the first knock back. But David Buckingham, who retired from the Institute about five, six years ago, he moved to Leicester in the meantime. He came to my office. I always remember that because it was so generous. He spent over an hour explaining to me how I could have got that interview. And um, basically he was saying I'd just completed an MA he said, so your, your academic qualifications are fine, but you need publications. And I think that's something from people to draw out here. If you want an academic job, the things which employers tend to look for are teaching experience, publications and successful funding proposals. I mean, in lots of ways, you, you need to be able to teach and teach well. But in lots of ways, I think um, research has actually become more important because it carries funding. So every four years we get assessed as a department in terms of our outputs. And just in case anybody doesn't realise, I mean, mine and Brett's contracts are um, they're split three ways. So there's a third is teaching, a third is research and a third is leadership. So if you've ever wondered why, why we're running around like headless chickens, that's that's probably why trying to juggle so many different plates I'm sure you're at the same in your jobs I'm not trying to pretend this is any harder for us than anybody else we do have compensations of course okay so David Buckingham spent a lot of time talking to me about um, funding proposals and publications and he said you could think about doing a PhD and I just dismissed that I thought no not for me at that time so I went on um, to another two administrative jobs, I think. But in the back of my mind, what, what was happening was the further I got up that ladder, the more I was managing people and controlling budgets. And I thought I didn't set out to do this. And I felt very much as if I'd got my ladder against the wrong wall. So it became a big question for me around 1997. Where, how do I move my ladder? And where do I move it to? Because I had an established, successful administrative managerial career burgeoning, but it just didn't feel right for me. So I thought, how do I get into something that I do want to really do? So I decided to do a PhD. And I, at that time, I mean, the Institute didn't have, um, I, I, my fees were waived at the Institute. So that was a huge incentive for doing it there. Um, and um, I thought, well, what do I do it in? I had several ideas. I approached people. They didn't want to know. So I went back to David Buckingham for advice and I told him my ideas and he kept sitting there going, hmm, I'm not sure. Hmm. And then I said to him, well, my original idea was to do something about gender and technology. And he said, but that's exactly what you should be doing. But all these other people had said, no, um, that's not a good idea. So I was so glad I talked to him and he said, look, if you write the proposal I'll supervise that and I was just so grateful to him for his interest and we did bring out I actually established my proposal was around how families use the internet but I was interested at the start in gender because I was just getting married and I'd read quite a lot of them the um, literature about how women lose out in marriage so that was on my radar and uh, I can see a few faces being full there and and also I became more and more interested 
in um, how social inequalities got reproduced through the uses of technology. Now, I'd done, an, I'd done a PGC in English and media. And um, part of that had been looking at technology and part of it was understanding that, you know, social reproduction means it makes a difference to the books you have in your home or um, how much time you're encouraged to read at home and things like that. And pretty quickly, when I was looking at my my uh, participants in my PhD, those kind of patterns started to become very clear. And what happened was during my PhD, for personal reasons, I had to have a bit of time off. So 1998, when I started my PhD, you got the early adopters, you got, you know, big houses in posh bits of London and um, very affluent people who, who had the Internet. By three, four years later, as I say, I had a pause in the middle of it. I came back and it was much more widely distributed and quite a much broader range of people who had the internet. And it was fascinating to see the differences. I get very cross when people say that working class people don't care about the children's education, because I remember visiting some people who they'd lost everything through, if people knew about this minor strike in the eighties, they had lost everything. I was having to rewrite my questions on the, the hoof because I was saying things like how do you shop online they didn't even have credit cards they couldn't get credit anymore they were they were broken financially but they got dial-up connections I remember one woman in particular and she stayed up all night trying to print out revision materials from the BBC for her children you know so this is why I get so cross when people say uh, working class people don't care about the children children's education of course they do they just sometimes don't know how to do it you know and they don't have the same resources in in all sorts of ways I wasn't going to get into Bourdieu but I did use Bourdieu's theories about uh, social economic and cultural capital in my thesis to try and break down what the differences were so then I started applying for jobs now I got a bit of experience and the next one was working with Professor Karen Evans on a three-year European project which then totally widened my experience to working on a European project, which was fascinating because not only did I get to travel around lots of places, wonderful places in Europe, such as Greek islands, Lisbon, um, Portugal, which is Lisbon, of course, Helsinki, Finland, Uvascular. It was an amazing project. But we also, in each of those places, we visited schools or other kinds of um educational institutions that's when I started to realize how different education was in different places different policies different methods different pedagogies just absolutely fascinating um, and I love to go on holiday now but it's never going to be as exciting as it was as going to, into those places and seeing things act you know so so differently really okay so what what I'm trying to bring out here is flexibility. I mean, I have a, a media background. I'd got a PGCE. I'd always been interested in education. I'd always worked in education, even as an administrator. Um, but the two projects I've just described were not that close to my own subject. They were not media. They were not technology. They were, you know, I did try and bring it out in those projects. Um, but really, it was a case of just gathering experience and being as flexible as I could to gain that experience and, and keep in work for a while. And uh, <coughs> excuse me, one thing, I mean, yeah, but I could talk so much about those projects. I, I do remember one example where I, uh, I started asking young unaccompanied asylum seekers who were outside education what they were looking up on the internet. We were all sitting outside. It was a sunny day. They come from Albania and Iraq. And for some unknown reason in my head, I thought they were going to be politically activated and members of Amnesty International because they'd had to seek refuge. They were 15, you know. So I said to them, what do you look at on the internet expecting Amnesty International and workers' rights and Britney Spears? <laughs> you know, it's just like... I don't think I've ever done an interview when somebody's not taught me something, you know, just totally mind expanding, really. OK, so then I started to be in a position where I could move more closely to the work that I was doing. And I was lucky enough to be offered um, 
another European project on a project called Media Pro, which was looking at how young people use technology, which was with Andrew Byrne. And this was in the Centre for Children, Youth and Media, which was headed up by David Buckingham. And I moved over to the London Knowledge Lab, which again was a great experience because the people work in there, you know. Um, and um, that was a couple of years. And again, lots of travel, which was great. And um, a real chance to understand how we talk to children about technology. Alongside this, my PhD was going on. Um, the main problem I had at the time was just, yeah, in that situation, you have to be very entrepreneurial. So, because you're trying to build up a salary at the same time. So somebody offers you some teaching. Oh, yes, you know, somebody offers you some uh, another project on top of that one. You're keen. You're trying to bid for projects all the time to make sure you stay in work. So I don't think in academia there's enough acknowledged about how entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, if I can say it, you have to be to kind of try and keep in work. You know, coming to Lancaster, the privilege has been actually having a fixed salary and fixed job. And I won't say fixed hours, but um, you know, just actually having that security for once, because a lot of the other jobs that I did were on contract. And I thought that was a good, I actually thought it was worth doing because I loved the work so much. But it is precarious. And, you know, I was lucky to have, um, I'd already bought a flat in London and things like that when I was working full time. So, the, the, any gaps in contracts, I wasn't in a desperate situation as you might be. As I say, I think things have got much harder for people starting out now. Um, OK, so then I finished my PhD. Now, my two examiners for my PhD were Sonia Livingstone from the LSE, whose work you might know, and Neil Selwyn. And Neil Selwyn was working at Cardiff at the time, but he, he then came to work at the London Knowledge Lab. And um, I was so lucky because he arrived and said, how about we do a project together? And I thought, wonderful, it's Neil Selwyn, you know? And uh, so we we put in a bid with John Potter and we managed to get the funding. I think it was from Vector. And actually what Neil and John really showed me was how to turn a small project into a huge amount of, what's the word? Outcome, output. So, I mean, it was a six month project and we really worked hard. Um, one of the things, see if it disappears and thing, one of the things which came out of it was um, I learned how to write a book. <laughs> uh, we did this between the three of us. And the project was really interesting as well because we had a futures dimension. So we asked children to draw pictures of what they thought technology should look like. And we discovered that actually it's very difficult to be creative about something in the future without referring to the past. Um, we also we had we asked children to interview each other. So rather than doing us doing the interviews, it was a, a primary school project, seven to 11 year olds. So we we asked children to do the interviewing of each other. And that was fascinating. And uh, we kind of. One of the things that showed up was even at age seven, eight and nine, girls had a lot less confidence in doing it than boys. Um, I still think there's a project there to go back. There's there's along the way, I've I've noted a lot of things about gender. It's like if you you have to be careful if you're asking children and adults about their own skills online, because um, men and boys tend to rate their own skills more highly than girls and women. But if you're then able to measure those more objectively through a different method, generally the girls are coming out a bit better. So I think that's one of the most important lessons I've learned, that it's difficult sometimes to take people at face value. I mean, I now speak to disabled children about what's happening in schools and they say, oh, it's fine. And I'm looking at it thinking, it's not fine. You know, they're just resigned to low expectations. It's terrible. It really is. Anyway, another tangent. So did the book with Oxford, uh, with Neil and I needed something new. And one of the problems of still being at the Institute was some people still thought I was an administrator. Um, 
And Neil kept saying to me, you need to actually strike out on your own. You need to go and work somewhere else and you need to start building your own profile independently. So I applied for a job and got a job at Oxford, which um, was very exciting for my dad, who hit my dad's passed away now. But at the time, it was very exciting for him because he had at least heard of Oxford. So, <laughs> you know, you have to remember, I'm a working class kid. And I'm working at Oxford. So, as I say, it surpassed a lot of people's expectations, even my own at this stage. So I worked on this project for a year um, and it, amazing people to work with, people like Chris Davis, Rebecca Einan that I worked with. And um, also got to know Ellen Helsper a lot, who works at the LSE and her interests actually overlap mine a lot in terms of inequalities and technology. And... Um, after a year, I applied for a job at Future Lab, which is a not-for-profit, and it was a permanent job. I was sick of being on co contract, so I thought I'll, I'll actually move to what looked like a permanent job. And I did get a job as principal researcher there, one of four principal researchers. One of the others was Ben Williamson. You might be familiar with his work now. Worked with wonderful people, Lindsay Grant, who I'm still working with, Carla Perotta, Alison Oldfield, Sarah Payton, too, too many to mention. Um, and what actually happened was after I'd been there a year, we got a huge European project. We tended to work more in teams there than as individuals, which is interesting because in it often feels within academia that you work more as an individual. But there we worked in a team. So we put together a project and we got the funding for it. And um, it was called iTech. And I will put a link to that just here. I'll tell you the story about this. So I've got some European project experience. At this stage, I hadn't led a work package myself. And in the interim, the whole organisation of um, European packages, European projects changed. So that rather than having one coordinating body and they lead everything, um, we now had a central coordinator of European school net, but I was leading a whole work package, work package two. So you get European school net who set it up and work, work package one and they did the project management. And then we're straight off and running and we've got 27, I think it was countries. We've got 14 ministries of education. Um, there's a meeting in Brussels where I, I talked to about eight people about what we're going to do. I have literally known we've got the funding for this project for about two weeks. And two weeks after that, we lost all the funding for the organisation. Um, the organisation was funded. It grew out of Nesta, Future Lab did. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. And um, we had the bulk of our funding was from Bechter. And when the 2010 election took place in the UK, um, Vector lost its funding, which hugely short-sighted in terms of what happened in COVID and the, the absolute reliance on digital provision for education. And um, Steve and I, my husband, had, we'd just bought a house and suddenly 26 people were made redundant. Um, the office closed. It was traumatic to say the least. And I did manage to hang on to my job, but then I was left delivering a £400,000 project from a spare bedroom um, with two different, um, three, sorry, three part-time people on contracts who decided to stay while they found other jobs. So I think it's fair to put my head in my hands at this stage. Uh, did I mention the word resilience at the outset? <laughs> I mean, it's just... It was absolute nightmare. Um, and we'd got a lot of the project depended on us having facilities. And suddenly we hadn't got those facilities. Well, I say we, there were about three of us. And, you know, a lot of the meetings were supposed to be held in our building. We no longer had a building. It was just absolute chaos. So anyway, I managed to survive uh, two and a half years of that and um, the project with itself was really interesting because we developed um, innovative technological scenarios for classrooms 
and the I won't go into it much because I don't have time. But if you get a chance to look at the website, look at some of the videos, the impact of that project across Europe has been huge in some countries because there are some countries where they were not doing teamwork so much or group work and um, it made a huge difference in those classrooms. So we kind of filtered through technology what we thought would be helping them in those places. So, yeah, it was fascinating. And in turn, we learned from those countries, you know, just fascinating kind of exchange of technology and pedagogical ideas, really. OK, so um, decided it was time to move out of this spare bedroom. So I applied for the, oh yeah, I missed out that uh, one of the reasons I, I did move was that we actually merged after two years, we merged with the National Foundation for Educational Research, um, which is a great organisation, but actually they changed my job and they made me a research manager, which put me back in charge of budgets and management again. And I thought, oh dear, this is exactly why I kind of rechanged. That's why I moved my ladder. This is not what I set out to do. It actually took me, it moved me back from the research I wanted to do. So I applied and I got the job at Lancaster. Um, and I have to say, it's been wonderful to finally be able to settle somewhere. You know, I kind of, we were, we were really sick of packing boxes and moving on and it was costing us a fortune as well. Um, and in terms of research, what it's really given me the opportunity to do is to develop a much stronger trajectory. So those early projects, I was flapping around doing whatever anybody else needed me to while I, I learned. Then I managed to move my career much more closely to the things I was interested in. And then at this stage, it's like, well, hey, I got to do the research I really thought was important. And I would say that to anybody, you know, and your PhD, particularly when you get to part two, do something you're really interested and committed in, because tenacity is a key part of this. You'll notice I've not mentioned anywhere along here kind of intelligence, intellect, all those things. If you're on the PhD, we take those for granted. Um, you know, it is, it's hard work and it, it's tenacity in a lot of what you do. And it's interest to keep you going for such a long period of time. This may be the biggest piece of work you ever do. But what I've been able to do at Lancaster is to build on projects. So, you know, I did a project, I don't have my CV in front of me, but um, I did a project, you know, a small pilot looking at um, disabled children, digital technologies. And that actually was the the basis of this book, um, there's really limited research in this area. And while I'd been able to, I'd done one project before when I was at the Institute on um, making online courses accessible to young people, sorry, to students, not young people, to students in higher education. But this job has given me the freedom to really pursue what I think is important. And given the limited research on disabled children, um that's where I've kind of put my time and my efforts so at the moment I'm doing a project which is looking at how we develop resources to help um, teachers be more um inclusive because what's happened with inclusion is that disabled children have been moved into mainstream schools but not not necessarily very well integrated they can be in classrooms but they're still do, doing separate activities or they're um you know, they're kind of acting in a different way or they have a teaching assistant whispering instructions at them. So what they're doing is mediated by a different person, the teacher, that there's a whole raft of issues in there. Um, but because teachers are so overworked and overloaded, it's very difficult for them to find the time to dig their way out of this. So I think it's a, I think that's that's been a really important part of my research to me, actually trying to provide the space and the time to facilitate other people to do, I won't say their job is better, that's patronizing, but but to try and provide the reflection and the support. You know, ITEC was a huge action research project and that's ideal. You work with teachers, you kind of try and work out what their problems are um, and then you draft an agenda according to that and then you constantly monitor it. That's one way of doing research, as you'll know. Um, but with this, what I've tried to do is listen to teachers and really understand what the issues are 
and then try and that's great john yeah i think action research grew out of teaching actually it grew out of teachers but there's still that funding issue that you end up going in with your agenda because you've had to get the research first you've had to get the funding first which is a problem but um yeah i think it's um hugely important that we if you're interested in schools and teachers and we just try and move things forward do you know when uh, in situations like this and the most recent piece i'll wind up with this the most recent piece of work i've done now i'm lucky enough that this has just gone live while we're speaking rebecca marsden has put this together but a couple of us in the department were recently invi invited to contribute to this new book by the Digital Futures Commission. And the challenge I wrote this with Lindsay Grant, who I first worked with at Future Lab, was to explore whether and how data collected in schools could be genuinely empowering for disabled children. I'm sure you know about this in schools, online, everywhere, huge amounts of data is collected and commodified. Um, ben Williamson's written about this, so Neil Selwyn. Lindsay did our PhD about it some years ago. And it's awful. There's kind of like um, whatever we do behind it, there's a level of data being collected. Um, it's often not looked at. The ed tech companies are commodifying it and selling it. It's, it's argued that it's the benefit of education, but it's really difficult to see how. Um, so we actually concluded in the end that every benefit there could be it was a double-edged sword and each benefit would bring with it potential harm um so that's the last piece of work I, i've done it's really nice that rebecca's managed to put that online just as uh, i'm doing this and uh, there was a presentation of it last week the recording will go up soon but the book itself is free if you have a look at the link i've put in the chat and the book is free. And I think this is an area which is absolutely ripe for research. It's state of the art, this stuff. And there needs to be much more, many more people looking at it because it's really become a huge problem. Um, to give you an example, I did a photography course last year and I, I had to consent to, as part of signing up for the course, I had to consent to all my data being collected and used in whatever way they wanted to otherwise I couldn't do the course you know that is not meaningful consent and when you compare it with the kind of um, loops that we jump through to gain ethical consent and yet you can put a computer in a room and you can collect anything I mean people who've done research on this uh, have tried to track what data gets collected they can't even find that out you know, teachers don't know. Teachers are working in schools. They're having to go along with this because they get no choice, but they're not happy about it. You know, it's just a, yeah, big egg tech companies that have taken over schools, really. So, okay, on that very positive note. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jess Stommel and Jan MacArthur in our department has done work on Turnitin and we actually use it very carefully now um, because we discovered that there's a question of ownership once work has been submitted to turn it in. You don't necessarily own your own work anymore. It's usually problematic, but that's if you can be bothered to read. I mean, it took Rebecca and I some months to get the turn it in terms and conditions. And then I can't remember how long they were. I think at least 100 pages long and you would have needed a lawyer to really understand them. You know, none of this is proper consent. OK, I will stop there, but I hope that's been helpful. And I hope I've also I know I've brought out moving house. Uh, I think I've brought out resilience. People, as I say, I've just been so lucky to work with such constructive, great people and here at Lancaster as well. Um, and students, you know, in the same way that I said, every time you do an interview, you learn something. Every student you work with teaches you something as well. So it was particularly good to be invited today. Thank you. Well, that was amazing. Uh, thanks, Sue, for that um, uh, kind of potted history and, and some, of, some of the really interesting research projects as well. 
I know Phil and, uh, and Brett will know that I'm a massive fan of kind of critical theories and things like that. So I'll probably want to like, bend your ear at some point about about inequality and inequity and things like that. Just wondering if anybody has got any questions that they'd like to ask Sue at all. Um, Prian did mention about ethics. You you noticed that the sort of work I do, yeah, um, you have to build a lot of time in. It's uh, it's what I've usually had because the Lancaster's uh, ethical approval process. What I have had is that people are committed to what I'm trying to do, and they really try and work along with you. I know there was a professor last year. Who, I was going backwards and forwards all the way through with ethics and he was coming back to me in half an hour saying can you say this can you say this you know and kind of he he was amazingly on it and just really trying to help but it can be quite problematic if people aren't familiar with the situa situation in schools. I raised this with the faculty actually and what happened was that somebody swam up to me in the Lancaster swimming pool and said would you like to join the ethics committee which is not quite what I had in mind. <laughs> so just on on ethics actually so really interesting so if you're working with particularly with disabled children how, how what's what's the the the, the kind of ethical I don't, I don't want to kind of get, I know it's probably a really really big question but what's the kind of ethical backing and working with potentially vulnerable people what, what's your what's your approach in terms of ethics there? um they they tend to be very difficult to recruit because schools have very strong gatekeepers around disabled children um i mean we always have to have a dbs check before you can go into a school and do research anywhere anyway i think that over the years ethical procedures have made it much harder to talk to um I don't want to call them marginalised, but groups that are le more disadvantaged groups of children. Having said that, please don't conflate disability with disadvantage, which I've just done, because it's much more complex than that. Um, uh, what was your question, John? Okay. What are the problems? It, it, well, the, it, the potential pitfall, because uh, you know, sometimes there's the the uh, I know there's there's like requirements to have a, a another adult present and things like that, and whether that could kind of sully data collection in any way and and things like that it's just just though that those kind of the, the potential minefield of ethics that you you could have with interviewing particularly young disabled children uh yeah i think you're absolutely right i mean i think there's an assumption that disabled children will be more vulnerable and again there's another negative conflation of terms there not all disabled children are vulnerable um Yes, I've generally in my research had to have somebody in the room. Um, so the next project I do, I will rethink that because, yeah, it's different. You know, um, sometimes you find that teaching assistants, however well-intentioned, interrupt and they answer questions for young people. So I think actually uh, the next project I do, I will go in through homes because I think... Um, parents sometimes have more confidence in the children than other people in schools because they're in a different kind of role. Um, but the broader point I was going to make is that because of ethics, it's actually, you know, if oh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 14 years ago, you could do research with a school and that school would have blanket permission from parents to let you do that research. Now you have to write to parents and it's very often the kind of parents who have consonants with the school already and feel very confident with those teachers who will then agree to their child doing research, uh, being part of a research project. And that's hugely problematic because you're not reaching the children that you often need to. So I've, yeah, I get very frustrated with that because I don't think I'm acting any more ethically or, or less ethically than I ever did. I still don't test on animals and I never will, you know, uh, which is part of the procedures that we fill in. I don't handle toxic materials, but, you know, it's, um, I can see why they're there, but I think a hidden implication of this is it's difficult. There are difficult to reach groups now for research and that is a real problem. So, you know, if people are putting in ethics and don't don't be put off, just keep going because you'll often find somebody who will work with you 
and find ways around it. That's really interesting. Thanks. So just just, just interesting from an ethical point of view, because, you know, but the mm. half works with uh, disabled children quite a lot. And so um, through E8, you probably come across educational health care plans and, and things like that. Yeah. So yeah. She, she writes those. So you know, it, it's interesting right. to see that kind of side of things as well and, and research to kind of strengthen that would be interesting. But yeah, I think the, the other thing there, John, is uh, methods. You need mm. methods that work with your different groups of children I mean I don't do straightforward interviews very much anymore because um I don't think that gives you the best results you know so I, I, tr I used to try and depends who I'm talking to I have a student actually I'm supervising um on her PhD and she's looking at brain damaged students in higher education doing online courses and she's actually worked she has um I think eight participants and she's worked with each one to establish how they can respond. She's got a group of each of them is a case. She's got interviews. She's got blogs. She's got diaries. She's got but she's actually worked, worked with each individual individually to tailor methods to what they can manage, which is just mind blowing, I think. I think that's really interesting because it kind of harks back to something that one of our other um people uh Tunde Varga Atkins was saying in one of her talks about I work with her so I know her I know her, I know her, her, her working practice as well about getting uh, I can't remember multi multimodal responses I think she was looking at and, and mm. multimodality so allowing people to express how they feel about something in a way that they feel comfortable with which is really interesting and you know Absolutely. trying to represent things in different ways like through drawing or poetry or, or something Mm. that's fascinating oh, thank you so much Sue. thanks for sorry i've kind of hogged the questions here does anybody right. else have any, any good i'm just fascinated I mean, the, by what you're saying so yeah. i mean the, the other thing with ethics is occasionally a child tells you something that you have to report and that's really difficult in 20 gosh it's 24 years now since i started my phd in 24 years that's happened to me twice gosh where i realized they were in a position of potential abuse and had mm. to get in touch with the school and break confidentiality and you know but that's always part of the consent with children that if something like that arises you will so again that does that does that fit in with the kind of child protection laws and and things like because I, I remember being trained in that a little bit when I was teaching but the yeah it does I mean on one occasion somebody told me she was in close contact with a man who was twice her age and they were going to meet what what do you do you know um that's, that's really interesting uh, mm. yeah does any anybody else have any <laughs> other questions I, I can't say anything in the chat um somebody's saying that they've moved away from turn it in because of the data stuff sean there um lots of thank yous for you oh that's nice um, thank you <laughs> uh i i have a question go ahead uh, so you might cover that briefly in your talk if if, if i missed that i do apologize um so with children they give you consent if do, do their parents have to give you consent as well and what yeah. if they disagree what if the, the child let's say they're 15 obviously they're independent, independently minded and what have you they want to take part but they are under age and the parents says no then where do you what do you do um firstly you have to get the parents consent for any child under 16 in the uk can be different if you're researching children abroad but in the UK if they're under 16 and I would always ask them uh, the child themselves at the beginning if they're really happy to do this because I don't think anybody should have to talk to if they don't want to. <laughs> More thinking about if a child really wants to but their parents says no because they don't understand the nature of your research or I, I don't know be overly I, protective or, or what I guess you. I would I guess I wouldn't hear about it because I, I wouldn't get to meet the child, so I wouldn't know. But it's an interesting one, that, isn't it? But then that might prevent you from kind of reaching out to, we were saying earlier, the, the kind of, the, the ones that you really want to reach out to, but you can't because you don't, your message isn't getting across to them because of the, yeah. the gatekeeping, be that the school or the parents or guardians or, you know, the layers yeah. before you reach to the to the children, isn't it? Yeah, I mean... 
one I haven't done this, I don't think. I'm trying to think if I've done this. But one way you can recruit children is through after school clubs. And then that might arise where a child wants to take part and a parent says no. Because you need consent from both. You need them to want to take the letter home and then you need parental consent. But personally, that's never happened to me. So it's just fascinating that sort of working with children is so much more complex than working with us like adults because I, yeah I don't know actually I just, one of the things that um I, I think is a real ethical dilemma is when you're in an interview with a child or a parent a parent generally and they're saying things to you that you really don't agree with and they have been racist or you know and you're like at what stage do I challenge this or at what do I just let the data keep coming you know that for me is a hugely problematic ethical question um particularly if it's I've done longitudinal research where you want to talk to them again next month and you're thinking well if at the end of this I say to you I'm I'm really offended by what you've just said they're not going to talk to you next month you know that's really can be really compromising I think so anyway Brett did you have a question uh, yeah, I was interested by the fact that so much of your work earlier in your career was in teams, and now you talk about working so much more on your own, and obviously that's helped you to find your own agenda, which is one of the key messages. But I was curious whether you ever miss working in teams, and whether you, that's that. What what would you suggest to people starting out about trying to mix up working on their own stuff and working in teams, things like that. <laughs> Um, I still work in teams to an extent. I guess the difference is that I lead the projects now rather than um, somebody, you know, somebody else being in a project that somebody's leading. I mean, like I was invited to give uh, this last paper for Education Data Futures. I invited Lindsay Grant because I knew she would bring something very special to that. And she's somebody that I very much enjoy working with. The project where I'm um, with more time, I could have gone into this a bit more, really. The project that I'm doing about teachers and um, how they become more inclusive. I'm working with Kathy Lewin at Manchester Met University. Um, so I'm still involved in networks like that, you know, people who I've worked with in the past and I still continue to work with. Within the department, it's more tricky because we have quite disparate interests, I think, you know, so it's not as if, um, yeah, we don't. We don't coincide. I've worked with other people from Lancaster, actually. And I think if I was to get into the, if I was to start working with disabled children again, next time, if I was to have my time again, I would actually, we've got a strong sociology department at Lancaster and they have people who are experts in that. Rather than me spending years trying to get to grips with things like the social model and critical disability studies, it would have been really helpful to work with somebody who could have rooted me through it. So I think, yeah, I think teams are the way to go, actually. But it's difficult. You've got to have people on hand. You've got to have people who are available. You've got to have people who want to work with you again, you know, all those things. I'd like to thank everyone for coming along. And uh, it's been a, it's been a fascinating, fascinating insight. Thank you so much, Sue, for your, um, your insight into your history and, and your research, and particularly the, some of the things about ethics as well. Uh, really, really interesting. Um, so uh, thank you so much for coming, everybody. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you all here with us. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> it's been great to see people. See you guys later. Everybody.